Welcome to WeIQ TV. My name is Judith Glazer and I'm the host of the program and I'm absolutely thrilled to invite and have now Joy Hirsch visiting with us to learn so much about what she's been doing in the field of neuroscience and actually in the innovation of the new tools that we're using to better understand how to read what's going on in the brain when two people are in conversation. This is unique. She has the only equipment like this in the world right now, so we are privileged to have Joy here. And I must say, uh, first, Joy, thank you so much for allowing us to visit inside your lab and see how you um, are doing the magic that you're doing and elucidating all the things about the brain that we've, in conversational intelligence, have wanted to know more about forever. So thank you for being well, here. Well, thank, thank you. It's my pleasure, actually. Good. Good. I need to let everybody know, if it's okay with you, about how long ago we met, because mm -hmm. it's not the first time <laughs> that we've <laughs> seen each other. Uh, we met over 10 years ago, over a decade mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. when you and I were sitting on the stage being interviewed mm -hmm. at UBS for, was this, that a women's, about women's I believe conference? it was. I yeah. think it was, uh, it was a women's um, conference. Yeah. Uh, um, it was sort of a, a how do you help, help women be yeah. successful in the business world. In business, world. exactly yeah. right, exactly right. So you did your, what you were talking about around the brain and I did mine around conversations and they came together so beautifully. So I was excited to follow your work and see how much you've grown now that you are at Yale. And um, what we're gonna show people is astounding. I really believe so. So um, thank you for sharing it with all of us at this stage because I know you have a lot more that you're gonna grow from this. So well, thank you, thank you're you. Welcome. You're welcome. So where, where do we start? What's the framework of the work that you would say is the most exciting um, work that you're focusing on now with the brain that will help us understand what happens when people have conversations? And if I guide you too narrow, broaden it for us, okay? Yeah, well, I think a, a, a really um, a, um, a first level place to start mm -hmm. is um, conventional imaging and how we know about, how we know what we know about the brain. Mm -hmm. And the last two decades have been just an explosion of information about the brain from neuroimaging. Mm -hmm. And traditionally what we do is that we ask people to go into an MRI scanner where we can watch the brain in action mm -hmm. and have them do specific tasks. And then we learn a great deal about how single brains perform specific tasks. Mm -hmm. And so we know a lot about how we um, uh, process um, things that we remember, uh, mm -hmm. how we see things, how we hear things, how we solve problems. We learn a lot about uh, decision making, even morality, um, and the brain in circumstances that we can create mm -hmm. within the scanner. Mm -hmm. But you can see immediately what the, what the limitation is. Yeah. We don't live in scanners. <laughs> we live in the yeah. real world. Exactly. We live in a world with other people. Mm -hmm. And indeed, one of the most important ideas from philosophy is actually that brains and interaction are really unique. Mm -hmm. that, a, you, that a brain that is interacting with another person is a slightly different brain mm -hmm. than a brain that is in solo mode, let's right. say. Right. So the truth is that, that this is one of the most important questions in neuroscience, and yet it is the question that hasn't been accessible. We haven't been able to answer this question about how brains, when they're interacting with each other, perform their task. Mm -hmm. We talk, we listen at the same time, we plan, we, um, we regulate what we say, we take in information, we share information. All this goes on simultaneously right. in real life interactions right. Right. that um, doesn't, doesn't uh, get represented. Uh, you've always been curious about a lot of things that have to do with how people connect with each other. And actually we're a pioneer from what I understand. You've been to a number of universities where you've developed or had people help you to develop the equipment that would do what your mind knew was the next level to see inside. Is that a fair thing to say? Uh, no, that, I think it's very, that's very insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of my, um, my MO, if mm -hmm. you will is to be on the developing side mm -hmm. of ideas and technology. I'm not so good at running things mm -hmm. once they're set up, but I'm a lot better at building them yeah. uh, when, it, when it's new. Yeah. And so um, um, I was one of the, the first people to do functional MRI, mm -hmm. running a laboratory, wow. looking at the brain uh, from, uh, from the inside of a scanner. Mm -hmm. But the question about two-person interactions 
has mm -hmm. been the question I really wanted to get at. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't possible with the technology that existed um, conventionally. Mm -hmm. And so when Yale recruited me, um, which was in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, I made a commitment to try to develop some new technology that would allow us to image two brains simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the technology that we're using, near-infrared spectroscopy that you saw a few minutes ago in the lab, um, has been around for quite a while. Um, and oftentimes it's used for studying uh, cognitive processes in babies. Um, really? Because we can't put babies in the scanner. And this technology has been developed for very limited uses mm -hmm. um, um, with small patches on the brain. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it hasn't, it was never as popular or as important actually as functional MRI. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my innovation was to um, ask the manufacturers of the equipment that we have, the Shimatsu in Japan, to tailor make a whole head system mm. so that we could use this technology like functional MRI, where we could image the whole brain of two people in actual natural interaction. I'm, I have to ask you a question. How often do you see them pattern or, or mirror each other? Because that's one of the big things that we, you know, we talk about when people are connecting and having good conversations and their brains, I'm now picturing their brain waves actually lining up and well, is that, that? That is exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, what happens when people are interacting mm -hmm. um, in a mode where they're actually sharing information mm -hmm. and that information is also is, is oftentimes not the explicit content of their conversation, but the sharing information of a social nature having to do with facial expressions, having to do with body movements, mm -hmm. having to do with eye contact, mm -hmm. having to do with a lot of sort of subliminal, if you will, mm -hmm. or implicit um, uh, connections between people. Well, what happens is that the parts of the brain that manage those specific systems, let's say like face processing, mm -hmm. the fusiform face area, and say social, social areas like the um, temporal parietal junction. Mm -hmm. Those areas are actually, if they're working together between two brains, they're actually correlated. So your, your, your hand gesture, they yeah, fit like the, together. Yeah, yeah. That is exactly right that the signals from your brain and my brain, for example, would be oscillating in synchrony. Mm -hmm. And so we use the word neural coupling or synchrony mm -hmm. or coherence mm -hmm. that describes signals that are responding and producing mm -hmm. in two brains coming together. And to the extent to which they're correlated mm -hmm. is the extent to which um, the brains are actually connected, or at least we measure that. That's how we measure it. You know, I'm going to push you a little bit more for something that um, I, I haven't yet heard the actual definitive answer to. Okay, okay. when you're picking this up and they're actually lining lining up mm -hmm. very similarly, mm -hmm. um, is there an energetic field? So there's certain people that study the energy as you connect, your eyes connect, and then there's kind mm -hmm. of an energy that happens. Mm -hmm. Is there an energy? Now I'm maybe going a step out. Um, but that you are thinking similar thoughts, that the pattern of whatever that energy is, we might even be saying, you know, I'll say something and say, oh, I was just thinking of that. People mm -hmm. ask all the time, is that mm -hmm. possible when we're mirroring like that? Mm -hmm. Or is that just made up, somebody called it, you know, woo-woo once, and it gets you know, in the way of real science. Well, you know, this is a question that is beyond where the science is now. But it is not impossible based on the interactive brain hypothesis mm -hmm. that there are specific effects of interaction and neural coupling. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what they are. Mm -hmm. um, the brain is different when there's neural coupling yeah. than when there's not. Uh -huh. I mean, we've done a series of studies here um, that are um, in the literature, or various stages in the literature, or out there being reviewed for some journal that show um, interaction of talking and listening mm -hmm. type. Mm -hmm. When people are actually connected, eye contact, they're, they're um, interacting, responding to each other, mm -hmm. versus doing the same thing 
in what we call monologue mode. Mm -hmm. So I talk, um, you listen, you talk about something else, I listen, I talk, you listen, but we don't interact at all. Mm -hmm. But we're still talking and listening, talking and listening. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turns out that the brain is very different during the interactive part than in the non-interactive part. Mm. And specifically, that particular study shows that it's Wernicke's area, this area in the posterior aspect of the temporal lobe mm -hmm. that is associated with reception, reception of language, reception of understanding of your environment. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with production, it has nothing mm -hmm. to do with what you say, mm -hmm. but it has only to do with how you're thinking about things. Wow. And so that's a really, really important finding. But that's when the conversations are very vanilla. There's absolutely no agreement, no disagreement, no there, It's telling and asking. Yeah, we, it's, yeah. We call that level one transactional. So you've just yeah. described it. And, and some people say, well, we talked, we interacted. And then when we analyze for them, really deconstruct it, they were now one talking, one is asking. But they're not coming together, really. Yeah. It's so a monologue mode. It's a monologue. Is what I, call both, it. I love that. It's, they're it's both a monologue. in monologue. Exactly. Both right. in monologue. And you yeah. can talk and li listen in monologue, but your brain is very different yeah. than if you're talking and listening in an interactive mode. Right. And that is a very robust finding. Mm. That's not just a marginal finding, it's a huge finding. And you've, you've been able to. And uh, we've done that with this, with this experiment. pattern. Fantastic. With, yeah. And that, that study is, uh, as I say, it's well. The paper submitted. It's we've had the we've had the result in our hands for a yeah, long time. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Um, I'm real excited about where we're gonna go with okay. this because we actually have three levels. The one is the transactional. Mm -hmm. The second, which I think you're gonna talk about next, is when people are in conflict. So when you start out and having very mm -hmm. strong positions, we call it positional. Mm -hmm. There's a healthy version of that, obviously, because people teach that in negotiation courses. Mm -hmm. But there's an unhealthy side where people are really knocking heads. So it, that can cause a different chemistry, and I'd love you to help us, because your work is el elucidating some of that. Well, I think so. Um, in in um, another experiment that we have done mm -hmm. here, um, instead of having people talking and listening uh, with just, uh, just doing something very rote, like mm -hmm. uh, object naming and descriptions mm -hmm. uh, back and forth, um, we have them, we give them a topic, and on some topics they're an absolute agreement with and other topics they organically disagree. We don't ask people to pretend. Mm -hmm. We actually ask people to assume or to represent their organic natural views and people differ in their politics, they differ right. in their um, ideas about child raising, they differ yeah. uh, um, in, in many many different aspects of life and so uh, we, can, we can compare yeah. conversations between people when there's an agreement mode and when there's a disagreement mode. And they can't, if they fake it, what I heard behind the lines, you know, I double clicked in my head, but is it true that if they're faking it, that it doesn't respond the same way as if it, they're... That's absolutely right. Oh, and, and fascinating. It, that that it, it actually, the first studies that revealed that are studies of facial expression, where if you ask somebody to fake a smile, mm -hmm. that that smile is very different. And the neural processes associated with that smile are very different from the smile that just happens because you just happen to be happy. happy. Yeah, exactly <laughs> and, right. Yeah. And, and that's a very different um, neural process. Can I guess something and you tell me if I'm right or you correct me, mm -hmm. that when you're really authentic and you really care and you're really smiling, that your eyes have a, they smile too? More yeah. so even, I would guess, because their eyes are so important in the well, process. And the, there, there is research that shows that facial muscle, mm. uh, including the eyes, eyes. but, but eye, everything. facial, yeah, everything. Um, the, the facial muscles are actually um, operated in a different way. Wow. And so that goes back to the brain too, because you know, where do these facial muscle, muscles get the control systems? Yeah. Well, it's from the sensory and motor systems mm -hmm. of the brain. And so they're responding differently and they're connected differently to the limbic system when the expression is genuine mm -hmm. versus when it's a top down, you try to smile, you try right. to um, um, imitate. So, uh, an expression. So if a parent, for example, or a teacher, or your boss um, really wanted to say to you, you didn't do a good job, but then they say, I can't do that, so I'm going to smile and say, great job, but mm -hmm. you know and they know that it wasn't true. 
and we're pre so we're, we're created as human beings to sense sense yeah. that. And yeah. No, we're extremely sensitive to um, conflict of that kind, yeah. where there's incongruence between the body language yeah. and what the word actually is. In fact, we just published a paper recently on exactly that, mm. um, using this technology, uh, showing what part of the brains it, um, what part of the brain is involved when there's an incongruence mm. between what someone says and what someone does. In fact, actually, this is really cool. Let me show you. This is published in, in PLOS. Could we, could we share that with our, our oh, audience? Because uh, they're, ver the they're voracious readers about this, so that oh, would be fantastic. Yeah, no, this is... We'll get, uh, when we're done, we'll get all okay. the details. That's Very great. Very good, but let me just show yeah. you main results uh -huh. here. This is it, right here. Yep. Um, this, this, this wonderful heat map. Um, that shows that. Um, well, let me tell you, the, tell you the experiment. Okay. We had this was an, an this was not a two-person experiment. It was a one-person experiment watching a video, mm -hmm. and the video was a person that was either saying yes or no. Mm -hmm. But on each time they said yes or no, they were either nodding the head or this, and the word was consistent. So if you go like this and you hear the word no, no. it oh. takes you longer. Incongruent. Yeah, Ooh. it's incongruent. So what the task was, we were measuring reaction times. The task was to identify the, 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 the expression, mm -hmm. the, the movement. So if I'm going like this yeah. and you hear the word no, it's going to take you longer to say that I'm really meaning yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so the incongruent case relative to the congruent case mm -hmm. with respect to reaction time and now with respect to brain imaging was what revealed this really beautiful result. And the result is this is the right superior temporal gyrus. And what this is is part of the what they call the temporal parietal junction. And this is a well-known area that specializes in interpreting social conditions. So this is sort of the social sweet spot of the brain. Mm -hmm. And awesome. um, it's kind of the focus of an awful lot of work that um, wants to understand um, interpersonal interactions. Um, but they usually have focused previously on interpersonal interactions as you can create them or imitate them in a scanner. Interesting, because um, we have some studies that talk about the TPJ mm -hmm. when um, people are sharing on their phone and that it lights up, because it is a sharing, it's social Absolutely. interactions. And, Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, that's exactly, and they want more, it becomes addictive, so dopamine goes up and all those things. Is that yeah. a little well, it, bit of um, that? Or? Absolutely. In fact, we've mm -hmm. had, um, we had um, a summer student um, a couple years ago do a, just a lovely study um, comparing face-to-face uh, -face interaction mm -hmm. with um, texting. Oh. And I thought, that uh, in the texting case, that it wouldn't be very social, and that uh, we it would be very um, inferior with respect to the neural processes, mm -hmm. um, meaning sparse yep. relative to the actual face-to-face -face interaction. But I was actually wrong. Mm. And what's really interesting about it, when you're texting, it's almost as if you have to use a theory of mind. You have to. It's like reading a book. You have to kind of understand and imagine what the person that is texting you wow. is thinking and saying. Wow. And so this whole area, the TPJ Lights area, up. was very active in the texting. And what was active in the um, actual face-to-face -face talking and listening was the left side homolog. That's Wernicke's area. That's on the other side of the brain. Uh -huh. The talking and listening, talking and listening. Yeah. And it's sort of like the machine that goes on in everyday interactions. But when you text, you have to use this theory of mind I thing. I love that. And wow. so it was the other side of the brain. So I have another, I have a, yes. uh, another summer student that's coming this summer, and we're going to follow up on that study. That study was not published. It was just it was a summer student doing a summer student project. But we're going to now make that a big project because it's extremely important. Well, to it's 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 smack in the face of what other people are saying. Well, it's know. almost like the opposite of what it, it really yeah. is. And we have to study this further before we have a, a really um, a, 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 before I have a definitive answer. Yeah. But those results 
were strong and interesting, and um, it really changed the way I think about texting. Uh, well, you've introduced something that nobody else has talked about, the theory of mind, yeah. that when you don't have the person there, in some way you're kind of imagining yeah. talking yes. to them, and so we've t not taken to, into account the visual part of our brain, which is visualizing yeah. the whole thing bef as it's happening, and that's more than when you're right there. You can get into transactional, where this there's a lot more thought going on. That's well, it seems so. That's what the results suggested, and I yeah. have to say, I went into that study uh, with ideas other than that. That was not my hypothesis. It yeah. was one of those things where I simply falsified my hypothesis and learned something that I didn't <laughs> expect to learn. It's <laughs> nice when science teaches us things we don't, sure. really, don't really sure. yeah. expect to learn. I, I have a couple extra pic other pictures here. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to show you was um, results from a study that's very much like the study that you just saw. And mm -hmm. I thought you might be interested in, in that because right. you saw the two people, they were wired up, set up, and they were doing experiment. I told you that it was about looking at each other and looking eye, away. Eye contact. One, eye one of the people's eyes started to get a little teary because he must have been doing it for intensely yeah, for a long it, time. And they were doing the eye contact experiment and the control experiment was to look at a video. Um, but here's an example. Oh. So this is like, one of the people in our lab mm -hmm. that was this wired up in the with the Efnir's optoed cap, and then there's a video mm -hmm. of him uh, doing the same thing, mm -hmm. and so we compared these conditions, looking at a real person, just mm -hmm. looking, not mm -hmm. not um, talking, mm -hmm. uh, as compared to looking at the um, the video, mm -hmm. and you expect, of course face processing systems to be active in all. In, in both conditions, you would expect everything to go on in the brain that scrutinizes faces. And there's a lot of territory in the brain that's devoted to faces, mm -hmm. and um, um, it's a very salient stimulus. And so this just compares the real face with the video face mm -hmm. um, in, every, in every aspect. And you, they're both social mm -hmm. um, and so on. Um, this is the full coverage of both people. Um, but this is what is so interesting. Wow. This is the, the, the real face versus mm -hmm. rest. The video face is still face processing. And then this was the plant, which was uh, a uh, very, very uh, different, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Very, very different. And so this is, th but these are the two things I'd like to just point out. Uh -huh. How much different it is when you're looking face to face when you're looking at just another video of a person. The different colors mean the intensity of the signal. Mm -hmm. And so the yellow means that the signal in the brain is very high. As, the, as this peak of activity sort of falls into the sea of noise, then it gets red. And you can see, you can imagine this as being like a little mountain of activity yeah. in, in the brain. Yeah. And that's the face-to-face -face condition, right? Um, as opposed to the with the video, uh, the, it doesn't have the, the big peak part. Yeah. It has. It shows that you're connecting. It in some show, way, you're connecting in some but way. But what I wanted to show you, which is like totally cool, and this gets back to your um, your one of your first questions about how how people are connected, mm -hmm. and this is uh, this illustrates um, the how much more connected people are mm -hmm. when they're actually looking face to face than uh, if they're both looking at a video of a mm. person. So this is an example of sort of a way we look at this. We look at the, this is the correlation between signals in the, in the two brains mm -hmm. from two specific areas of the brain, the fusiform gyrus, which is the face processing area, and the angular gyrus, which is this, um, this uh, social area, the TPJ. Mm -hmm. And we ask, how this face processing system differs mm -hmm. when you're actually looking at a real face than mm -hmm. when you're looking at a video face. Mm -hmm. And the difference is huge. Wow. That this is the, the real face and this is the, um, the, the, video? the video face. Oh my. So this tells you that this impact of looking at somebody mm -hmm. has a huge, huge effect on processing that's going on scrutinizing faces and going directly to the social area, mm. this TPJ area. Mm. Mm. So, so this this is is a deep dive into um, the machinery of the brain and how social it is and how important the connections are. So, a big question just jumped jumped up for me. If I am in a company where we use uh, Zoom and 
uh, different types of mm -hmm. electrical equipment. And that's how we have big conversations when we bring mm -hmm. together different countries mm -hmm, and so forth, mm -hmm. even people. Are, are we doing a disservice in some way? We've still got those studies ahead of us. And we're going to be doing the Skype mm -hmm. experiment yeah. uh, this summer. Right. Because right. the Skype experiment uh, falls, if you think of this as a continuum, most social, sort of social, yep. and not, not social, social. <laughs> uh, then the Skype experiment is right here. Okay. Because this is is reciprocal. Mm -hmm. in, a Skype in, a, in a Skype situation, there is a reciprocity. Mm -hmm. I talk, you listen, there might be a little lag. Um, it's not really not in your face. Not too much. Yeah. Not too much. It's pretty good. Yeah. So one would, I mean, I, I can see the hypothesis going either way because there are other things that go on with social proximity. Mm -hmm. The vision is different. The 3D is different. Mm -hmm. um, the You have a lot more closer view of of movements, of innuendos, of subtle effects, mm -hmm. um, environment, context. Yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's a richer situation when you're in front of somebody yeah. than if you've got them on a 2D screen. And it, it's a 3D versus a 2D problem. Yeah. Well, but let me tell you what's so exciting I'm about so, this, this piece of work. Can't wait. And this is the the segue here is how relevant this work is to the real world mm -hmm. and how much good people like you who talk about it in 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 circumstances where people are interested in interpersonal inter interrelations not just the science mm -hmm. um, uh, does to uh, uh, enhance the value yeah so this is a study that is a, is a wonderful study it was started by one of my students who was interested in socioeconomic disparities mm. And she wanted to know um, if the brain was different when it, the partner in a conversation was of a similar socioeconomic group than when the socioeconomic status of the partners was different. Different so meaning one's higher than the one's, other. Right. Yeah. And so we um, um, spread out the word to the New Haven community that we wanted all comers for this experiment. Mm. And she went out and stood in bus stops and various places where the people don't normally communicate with mm -hmm. Yale faculty. And we brought into this laboratory homeless people, people that were unemployed, people that were um, um, more or less pretty far outside the academic community. And we paired all comers with um, each other and with people mostly from the Yale community, not mm -hmm. everybody, mm -hmm. but we had, we made a conscious effort to bring in people from a wide range of socioeconomic levels, which we of course measured. Our dyads, dyads meaning two Thanks. people, um, were categorized by the numbers um, just automatically by socioeconomic uh, level was determined by education level and income, just those two things. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, dyads where the two people were very different and dyads where they were very much the same. Mm -hmm. So we, we formed our, our group of dyads yeah. into two groups. Yeah, so you had comparisons now, big yeah. comparisons, benchmarks. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So then we asked when these dyads uh, we're communicating with each other, they're talking. We give them a topic and they talk. The hypothesis was that in a everyday normal pro-social situation, mm -hmm. like you sit down at, on a bus mm -hmm. next to a stranger. Mm -hmm. That stranger might be like you, that stranger might be very different than you, but nonetheless you strike up a conversation because we're just social beings and right. we talk to people. We right. value diversity. We value being able to talk to people <laughs> who are different than we are. And so um, you, you have a pro-social conversation. But if that person is different than you are, what happens, or what's thought to happen, this is my hypothesis, that the regulatory systems of the frontal lobe would be called upon because you would be monitoring detecting mm. and regulating what you said um, to the person 
in order to have a successful egalitarian conversation. Yeah. So someone who's up here, I don't know what that means, but let's say up here, might have to downregulate certain things or move themselves down to feel like they were connecting. Is part of what's happening is the rostromedial prefrontal cortex, the like me, not like me part of the brain, wants to connect. They want to, yeah, they want to, so even though there's economic differences, somehow you still want to drive towards connection with that person. That's right. Yeah. But in order to do that, you have to call upon systems of the brain mm -hmm. that you don't have to call upon when you're in your comfort zone, right. in your comfortable social situation. Well, that hypothesis was validated loud and clear. And this is the first study of this oh, I got kind chills. That's ever, important. ever, I'm ever. Is that, that's going to help extremely. the world in what we're trying well, to do now. That's and what I was thinking, that one of the reasons it's important is that we as a society value diversity. Mm -hmm. And we value positive relationships mm -hmm. among diverse people. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a clue what that neurobiology is mm -hmm. that actually supports that end goal. Mm -hmm. And so this study tells us that it's these frontal lobe regulatory mechanisms that are called upon for a successful pro-social wow. co so, social conversation in those, in those conditions. Does, so, does that mean that there's an attempt to bridge the gap so that you connect more yes. that there's work that you try to figure out what's the algorithm of what I have to do differently in order to connect? That's right. That's exactly what the brain does. Mm. It, it works on systems that allow you to have a successful conversation or wow. connection. Wow. Now, um, this, this is just the behavioral results showing that the red are the, the high disparity dyads and the blue are the low disparity dyads. And people were never told. They were just, they told the, the, the experiment was about communication. Mm -hmm. They had no, they, no idea. none of them were straight, none of them knew each other ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Everybody was a stranger. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the, the high disparity dyads reported that they were more anxious, meaning that they were picking up on cues. Ooh. They learned in their, in, in their experiment that they were different from each other. Mm -hmm. They reported that they were more anxious, and they also reported that it took more effort. Wow. So more, they were more anxious, it took more effort. But now what's going on in the brain? Well, and what, some people give up when that is too big. That's probably true. It's yeah. probably true. What's going on in the brain was huge. And uh, you can see it's a small thing here. But this, this frontal lobe area, this huge frontal lobe area mm -hmm. that was more active during the high disparity dyads and the low disparity dyads. Wow. This stuff in the back of the brain that's just receiving and sending, receiving and sending is normally very involved in social interactions, which it is, but it's not differentially involved. Yeah, yeah. And remember, my first result showed the results here, and, but, but they're because everybody was the same. Yeah. But when, when everybody's the same, then the difference isn't here, the difference is in the frontal lobe. Look how hard, in this case, oh. people work in order to exactly. figure out, the prefrontal is trying to figure out, so what can I do differently? How do I adjust? How do I align? That's and right. it's working in the background, trying to Trying to make figure it work. It out. Yeah. yeah, and there's lots and lots wow. of ways that, that we show this. It's a very powerful result. But I like this result a lot because these, the socioeconomic disparities were based on things that can be changed. There were things that were created. The, mm. These these dyads were the same with respect to race. They were the same with respect to gender. They were the same with respect to age. Um, and the the dyads were equally mixed between female, female, male, male, and, and mixed. Mm -hmm. There was no difference other than education and income. Uh -huh. So these are things that can be changed. Huh. And here, what we're learning is that is these are not deep structures that are looking at at physical features. This is the part of the brain that's adaptable. It, it, right. So it's, it's, you can train it. Oh. That you can you can fix it. This is this is the, the the social system trying to be social. So I'm going to jump forward into uh, what we see in executive sometimes, which mm -hmm. is you have a a very stern, tough. Uh, executive who doesn't have certain sensitivities with their team. Mm -hmm. And so they stand out and they feel like they're separate from their team in a lot of ways. The team doesn't feel that they're on their side. So they make all assumptions uh -huh. based from those differences, whatever those differences uh -huh. are. Uh -huh. If, if, if our, these leaders could see these kinds of pictures uh -huh. 
and say, let's do some experiments. You know, it looks like you're having friction and the team is actually saying that you are. So what would happen? What would we, you need to do in order to make a connection? You don't have to change your body physically, mm -hmm. but some of the ideas and how you present them. What could you be working on? And they see an actual picture or it doesn't have to be their case study, but it helps in understanding. But this, yes, As, this doesn't answer your question, which is the important one. How do you fix it? Yeah. But what it says is that the biology is there to fix, fix it. it. Right. That we know where the, where the brain is working. And so it's very hopeful because you can say, this can be fixed. Mm -hmm. You just have to retrain these cognitive control or regulatory systems. Mm -hmm. Which ones so, are they? Do we know, do you, uh, can you well, identify? Regular, it's in the pre it's prefrontal. Prefrontal. Yeah. Regulatory systems. This, this is an example where um, science is kind of a blunt hammer. Yeah. Um, uh, we do lots of experiments of, that require the control mechanisms to be active. We say, yes, this is where they are. Clearly, there are multiple systems interacting to, uh, in, in a live, fast-moving, uh, natural conversation. Um, it's not one thing. Yeah. Uh, what's really interesting is that um, in the case of the high disparity dyad, the brains really do connect, and they connect with these frontal lobe mechanisms. Wow. It's not the it's it's the the areas of the brain that are working, mm -hmm. and this is just additional evidence that it's these regulatory mechanisms that are going on in both people, and they're feeding off each other, they're connected, wow. they're matching, wow. matching the regulatory mechanisms. How does that feed things like oxytocin and the good feeling neurotransmitters that we love, you know, to... Yeah, it, that's a very much a different level of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's a neurochemical level. Right. And um, these are, there are multiple systems that make us social. Mm -hmm. And the neurochemical one is one of them. Right. Uh, brain systems and and mechanisms that drive us to connect, yeah. to look at each other, to seek each other, to um, to affiliate in one way or another. It's not um, a simple answer. It's then. not a simple answer. <laughs> no, That's no, okay. No, I, I got answer. that. But I like anyway. to, I like to simplify things if I can, but it sounds yeah. like this is this is so new and it's got so many implications. Well, there's so much we don't know. Yeah. And that's the problem. I think that um, it, it takes a, sort of a reductionist to come in and say, okay, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. This is what's the next question we have to answer, and then the next one, and then the next one, a systematic approach. And of course, science is so slow and kludgy relative to the sophistication of the questions and the need for answers. Yes. There's always this disconnect. Yeah. There's a little bit of tension between science and the real world that needs that needs answers. Yeah. But what it can do is inform us in a quantitative, uh, scientific way mm -hmm. that the brain is participating in different ways. Mm -hmm. When in conflict, when in interaction, mm -hmm. when in um, Love. Uh, eye contact, yeah, when in affiliation, vision. exactly. Um, when solving social problems mm -hmm. or s just being a part of social situations, the brain is intended to be connected with another brain. Mm -hmm. And we've studied it for so long in solo mode, we haven't developed a strong theoretical framework mm -hmm. that represents our brains mm -hmm. as in a, in a partnership, yep. as in connection. Yep. And so, this is, these are new realizations that are emerging, mm -hmm. but not quite there. Yeah. And so I feel like it, it's possible to say, oh yeah, here's your brain doing this, it means you should do that. But I feel like we should wait until we have a little bit more evidence before we know exactly what this means. For example, in the case of conflict, where there are people that are just at each other, a very complicated thing. There's lots of different ways of having conflict. And there are two possible solutions. You either bring them together or you separate them. Right. And, and how your brain strategizes to resolve that conflict in each of those types of, of interventions is not known. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, so I think we should be hopeful that this work will take root mm -hmm. and that will be supported and developed and actually be useful. 
yeah. in the real world. So here's my fantasy after okay. learning what you're doing, that the next stage would be maybe some more equipment that when we teach, so a lot of what we do is teach people how to work out when you get into tight conflict and you freeze up or you mm -hmm. get angry and you suck it in and it, then it mm -hmm. gets bad. All those things we help leaders identify when they're doing that less functional behavior mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then teach them ways to bridge into finding aspirations in common, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if we have dreams in common, even though it started out like we didn't connect, all of a sudden we have a platform for connecting mm -hmm, the bridge, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, so we teach mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's not negotiation. It's yeah. something completely different and we call it level three transformational co-creational conversations where we mm -hmm. remove judgment and we step into the world of the other person to better mm -hmm. understand their world and mm -hmm. then find things in common and we knit a new tapestry. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're going to, I would love to picture that your equipment, the things you're designing mm -hmm. that we could bring into some of these beautiful experiences and actually map the things that I'm hypothetically saying are what's going on, how we raise the oxytocin, how we lower the cortisol, because we do mm -hmm, when, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we know that language does that, conversations do that. And how we employ neural circuitry that is engaged and, and there for the purpose yes. of resolution and social management. Exactly. Um, yeah, so there, um, along those lines, um, on the horizon, there are wearable devices of the kind that you see there. We're yep. actually working to develop some of those. Mini, mini, mini the versions. Mini of versions of these little hats. Yep. I doubt that they'll ever be very stylish, but nonetheless, um, they can be worn and signals can be transmitted remotely. So wow. that it, it, it is not a fantasy, it is mm -hmm. a, uh, a real world goal mm -hmm. that people should be able to not only listen to the individual talk, but I like to think of it as listening to the brain talk at the same yeah, time, yeah, yeah. and use the information back and forth to um, help resolve problems. Yeah. I think if the brain is being connected to the, the, the implicit messages, and the, the talking and the listening is the explicit message, and if you can kind of think of them as, as, as a, uh, a scene in a movie with subtitles, uh -huh. and, and you get both the scene and the subtitles together, yeah, go, right, that, yeah. that should be a very useful tool yep. to yep. Um, um, investigate uh, strategies for bringing people together. Yep. And I think it's extremely important, not just in our individual personal lives, but in our communities and larger social spheres, and then across global global communities. Which is what we're watching every yeah. day on TV. I, exactly. And, and how exactly. to do that in a way that doesn't lead to the wars that we've experienced. Precisely. Yeah. And so that's why I think that this type of work has a natural sort of pathway toward working on those types of yeah world peace type problems. Exactly. Now that's a bit pie in the sky. And it's I, okay, and I, I love it. As, as a scientist, I like to stay very close to, to the data. I don't mm -hmm. want to misrepresent it. Yep, so, yep. Um, but it, it's, it's not unimaginable. Not at all. That we could begin to take these ideas and the theoretical context is being built and apply it to uh, interpersonal interactions and inter country interactions yes. in a way that actually has meaning and, and output. Yeah, so your work is helping support that beautiful global uh, movement that I'm excited about because well, we touch different sides of it and are looking at some of the same things. How do we help people connect and, and synergize each other in good, healthy ways? And, and when that happens, we'll have people that live to over, more people living to over 100 in healthy ways, right? Because it, a lot of stress comes from the dynamics that are not healthy, and we wanna help put into place better conversations. You're looking to, to research mm -hmm. what's going on, so we're informed about how to do that. And I think there's a great marriage in, the, in putting these kinds there's, of things together. There's so, m so many future directions here. I mean, you just hit on a really important one, and that is the value of positive interactions versus the, versus the de deleterious effects of those that are counterproductive right. and stressful. Right. Um, we don't know uh, what those two types of interactions, um, how they impact uh, person's longevity, but of course there's a lot of people who think they do, yeah, that's right. and they probably do, <laughs> and so yeah. um, it's, uh, it's pretty important, I think, to maybe apply this new technology to um, 
answer those, those types kind of, of questions, questions. but totally not just agree. answer them to understand how to how to enhance yes. the positiveness of, exactly. of interactions. Well, we're working on that. And now I have thousands and thousands of people with me from 75 countries working on that. And it's, it's amazing. Judith. It's amazing. We have miracle yeah. stories every day. So we may not know all the science that you know about what's going on when we're doing certain things, but we do know that certain things are producing amazing results. So I that's feel great. like uh, I'm so glad that we met 12 or so years oh, ago. Yeah, and that's true. That yeah, was, yeah. That was, they were very, very fortuitous, actually. Yeah, I have to share with everybody that you helped set up a, a, a roving um, story about the mind that you were produ producing at the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I remember walking into that and I walked through something and it was crickle, crickle, crickle. Oh, oh my God, was, that was your brain that was lighting brain. up. Right? Yeah, that was <laughs> it was fabulous. So yeah. you are an innovator for the present and for the future and very inspirational. So I'm so glad we got a chance to connect well, again. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Hopefully we can continue this. I hope so too. Okay, great. great. Thank All you. Right.